Uh, so, uh, my name is John. I've worked for MongoDB as a senior solutions architect. Uh, basically, I, I go out to people who are you know, using MongoDB and help them use it a little better, help them you know, make sure they're following best practices, answer the tricky questions for them. Um, and the other thing I get to do is I get to go out and go to great cities like this one and, and meet people and, and do presentations. Um, for those that, that haven't heard, getting here was a little bit of an adventure. <laughs> Um, I came out of Edinburgh Airport yesterday, which was then closed because they found explosives in somebody's luggage. Um, and they did actually come across some explosives in luggage. Uh, which, the first thing they did is they sent us all out of the airport onto the runway, and then they put us back in the airport and they wouldn't let us out until they decided if they were going to interrogate us. And then, finally, they decided that they would let us fly. So we flew uh, to Krakow, uh, and then we cracked off. Crap. And then we turned around because it was foggy. Uh, we started going back again. And then I landed and then, then, then I came by bus. But I did make it here. I uh, didn't get here till 3 in the morning, but I did make it. So if I, if I fall asleep, that's the, the third thing you need to do. You all shout, wake up. But I'll not get you to do that. Really. Mm -hmm. On to the main stuff. Fuzzy searching in MongoDB. So, uh, quick show of hands, who's used MongoDB? Well, that's a good start for a MongoDB user group. Who doesn't use MongoDB and only uses Cassandra? <coughs> I'm loving this crowd already. <laughs> now, normally there's like somebody in the back who's just here to heckle. <laughs> um, fuzzy search in MongoDB. So what's fuzzy search and why do you need it? Fuzzy search is where you've got query, I want to find this, and it doesn't match your data. You wish it did, because the thing you're looking for is there, but the thing you're searching with isn't finding it. And there's kind of three ways that can happen. One, your data's wrong. So you know what you're looking for, but actually the data in the database is wrong. Um, or the data in the database finds what you've got the query on. Or uh, the more subtle one, the data you have is not all of your query. So you're being quite specific in what you're asking for, and the data isn't that specific. So who has that problem? Um, there are some really obvious places, and these come from you know, my background as well, so these are why I pick up these ones. I'm sure you can think of others. Um, fraud investigation. In fraud investigation, people deliberately change their information because they know it's not hard to beat the computers. The computers won't find them if they just make some changes to their name. The enterprise customer view. So this is kind of... I'm a big organization, I've got a whole bunch of IT systems, some of them I've built, some of them I bought, some of them came with other companies that I bought. I'm a bank and I acquired another bank. And now when I try and find a person, how do I find that person? Because their details are a little bit different in every system. And kind of a larger set, the top one, law enforcement and intelligence. So they're dealing with people who quite often work hard to not give away what their details are. So how do you go about searching for things when the data and the query might not quite match up? So the first problem you have is the misheard name. What, what did you say your name was? Yeah, okay, I've got that. So um, if you've ever been to Starbucks and you've given them a name and you don't come from exactly the same country as the person working in Starbucks, chances are whatever they write on the cup is not your name. Um, this apparently says Helen, A-L-E-N. Uh, there's actually, it turns out there's a whole website dedicated to Starbucks writing names wrong on cups. Um, but the truth is, it's easy to hear somebody's name wrong. And when you hear somebody's name, a lot of the time you won't ask them to spell it, you're just going to make a guess at what it is. And that really goes across cultures. So, if I hear somebody's name from Scotland, I have a reasonable chance of spelling it right. I suspect if, if you shouted out your names at random, and I write them down, I'm going to spell them wrong. So, one of the problems is people will enter data that they've heard. And that doesn't matter if they're entering data because you know, you're over the phone and you're filling in a form with somebody over the phone, or they're doing a search over the phone. Um, it's also very easy to, to type a name wrong. So, again, I'll, I'll type 
what I've heard, I'll, I'll hear it, but what I'll type is, is what I think it is. So what you need to get rid of this is the ability to search by sound. Now, Google do a very good job of search by sound, but that's not what I mean. What I mean is when I type something in, don't search for exactly that. Search for things that sound like that. And there is a solution to this, and it's a solution that's been around since uh, 1929, when they wrote the first algorithm for doing this. Uh, because they had US census data, and they were trying to work out which were the same people. And guess what? You know, even the census data from the turn of the century was bad quality, dirty data. So they created an algorithm called Soundex. Uh, it's not a very good algorithm, but it was pretty good for 1929 when they weren't even sure about the word algorithm. <coughs> Since then, some people have come along and done much better. Uh, there's an algorithm called Metaphone 2. It works for the majority of Western European names. Basically, we'll take a word or Western European words and, and permute them in a way that lets you find similar ones. Um, in America, you know, not only does, you know, there's one for Europe, and then there's one for America, and then of course each state's going to have to have its own one as well, because in America, they like to make things themselves. So New York State actually has its own uh, name matching algorithm. But I'm in Poland, so uh, my research says that the one you would use over here is one called, I don't want to guess how you pronounce that, I'd say Deitch Mokotov. Um, that is apparently the, uh, the, the good algorithm to use for Poland. Your mileage may vary. So what do these algorithms do? Uh, basically, you give them a word, and they give you a, a series of letters which represent that word. Now, what's clever about them is that if you give them two words that sound the same, in theory, it's going to give you the same set of letters out. So for my... Uh, demonstration program for this, and there's a, a URL at the end where you can actually download code to, to run this and have a play with all of these. Um, I used double metaphone. Uh, mostly I've been working with European names, double metaphone's a, a favorite one for that. This is the sample code you can download. It's basically an interface that lets you try out all the techniques that are uh, talked about in this presentation. Put some searches in, it's also got a thing to generate your whole lot of sample data to test on. So in this case, I'm going to search, sort of laser on this. Uh, first name, John, and uh, I'm saying find matching, sounds like. Who is the laser? Small button at the bottom of the screen. We take green light. Oh, yeah. Laser. So searching for John, all matching, so I'm going to match all of these things. There's only one, so. And the sounds like, um, and doing the sounds like search takes 95 milliseconds on my test data. That's not very quick, but it was on just on the laptop. Um, and basically pulled back a whole bunch of these. I think I've got 5 million names or so in there. Battery's about to die on this. Uh, what does that look like in the data? Well, basically, I've got my first name field, John. But what I've also added is a Soundex first name field. So I've added an additional field in there and put the Soundex in. And the way you do it is as, as simple as you think. When I search for John, run it through that same algorithm, find the Soundalike version, and search for the Soundalike version. Very simple concept, very powerful for bringing back uh, things that sound the same. So I search for Juan. It's got the same Soundalike. And therefore, that's where the, uh, you know, these are, where are and these are all the different things that it's found that it says sound like John. The next one is the careless typist. So these are even more common than you think. Uh, the problem is that users do type badly. In a survey that I did in the previous company uh, of data that had had a lot of free text fields. You know, fields where people, not big free text fields, people where you could enter first name, last name, address. You weren't picking from lists. 30% records had errors in them. Because normally the people that are filling in these forms, unless they're you, don't care. Their job is just to type your name in the form. They don't care if you spell it right. Nobody penalizes them. It's almost impossible to check for it. So. Um, a lot of data is very, very poor quality. 
And it's a very different problem to send along as well. Um, because John becomes Cone and Smith becomes Smurf. And those don't sound the same, no matter what algorithm you put them through. So what you're looking for is, in the cleverer ones, ones where it's a nearby letter on the keyboard, but generally you're just looking for kind of letters added, missed, and things like that. Uh, a little side to this, uh, you all work in the Middle East. Now, in Western countries, there are a lot of different ways of spelling Muhammad. So one of the challenges you have is looking for Muhammad. You need a whole dictionary of the, the 300 different ways people spell it. When you're doing it in Arabic, you don't have that problem because there's only one way to spell Muhammad, and everybody knows how to spell Muhammad. But this problem still exists. So when you work with a large database, what you discover is there are actually 50 different ways to spell Muhammad, because there are 50 different ways my key fingers can hit the wrong keys on the keyboard when I'm typing it. So I had customers saying to me, you know, every Muhammad is spelt the same. You still need to be looking for those errors. So, Here's a simple solution to the problem. You build a regular expression. You go to look for a name and you build a regular expression. And in your regular expression, you take the name and you put in every combination of adding or removing <coughs> one character or swapping two characters which are next to each other. So anywhere in this word, I can add an extra character. Any of those characters I could have deleted or I could swap two of them over. And so if I give it the name Joe, which is only three letters, I end up with a regular expression that looks like this. Now, regular expressions aren't too bad to a, a, you know, a fairly fast regular expression engine, the one in MongoDB is reasonably good. Um, there's a couple of problems you do have. One, you don't get a lot of indexing out of that. Um, because in MongoDB, a regular expression search is only going to hit the ones where it's the prefix. So if we find the Joe, but it will only look, it will look at all the J's, all the J's, all the O's, and so on. Um, the other problem is, if you haven't spotted it yet, that's fine for the word Joe, it's only got three letters and the regular expression is about 80 characters. But when you give it Christopher, you're looking at a fairly big query in there, and yes, the performance does drop appropriately. So that solution does work, and, uh, ah, Five million records or so takes about 45 seconds for each field you're querying it in. Now, there are some people out there, some customers out there, who that's absolutely fine for, but the majority of people, that's a bit on the slow side. What I included in this interface is uh, this typo naive slow, just so you can try it and see how slow it is. And you'll see here that I said I'm looking for Joseph Steed. Um, and it took 91 seconds to search my 5 million records. Much more than I'm happy with. So there is a smart solution to this as well. Obviously there would be, otherwise I, I wouldn't be telling you this. Um, when you create a collection, you also create a secondary collection, which is ultimately an index. That collection is just there to be a special kind of unique index. So when I insert, um, a name or multiple names into my primary collection, I will also insert those same names one at a time into a secondary collection, Oops. Um, which has a very simple data structure. ID is the name. So all it has is a unique list of all the names that are in my database. All the correct spellings and all the wrong spellings. Even doing that, that data is actually going to be quite small. Because relative to you know, 5 million, 20 million, however many people, how many people do live in Poland? 40 million. Yeah? There aren't going to be 40 million unique names, even with all the spelling mistakes and everything else. You're going to be looking at several thousand. And another 5 million in the UK. I've avoided all of those jokes. <laughs> um, so what you do is you run that same regular expression, but run it on this collection, on this vocabulary, this unique list of names that Mahogany is maintaining for you. What you'll get back is a list of all the words that are actually in the database that sound like your original name. 
And you can then use those with an OR or an IN query to retrieve all of those records. So rather than say, look at every record and find if the name matches this, it's look at the list of names, get the list of names that match this, and then just go fetch those records, records with those exact names. That's actually um, less than one millisecond to do the same query on the same data as the previous example. So Joseph Sneed, but this time using smart type algorithm, five million records, and I got my same two records back in less than a millisecond. That's one of a whole category of things you can do where, you know, if MongoDB's index doesn't do what you think, use a collection to build your own index. You'll find you're still getting, you know, great performance. The next problem we have is what we call the wrong box. Can you guess what this one is? I'm filling in a form and I fill in the wrong box. Again, it happens all the time. It happens because people are careless. Also, it happens, again, for cultural reasons. So, I have a website. I'm an international company. And it says first name, last name. Well, that's, that's fine in the UK because my first name is John. My last name, which is the name of my wife, my children, my father, is Paige Curry. First name, last name, sorted. Then you go to China. They do it the other way around. So you end up with people, for cultural reasons, not being able to do first name, last name, or terms like, you know, forename, surname, Christian name. You know, the, uh, the international standards document on how you're supposed to build a website says, give them a box that says, put your name in here, and don't try and break it up anymore, because nothing else works in that. I don't know any IT systems that actually do that. The best one I've seen is fill in all of these and in this box put what you want us to call you. <laughs> um, but it does cause a problem that it's not clear which is the first name or which is the last name. Also, people, and remember we talked about people in the uh, dodgy category at the start, people who are deliberately changing just enough to beat the system, will swap their first and their middle names. There are people who, on uh, important government paperwork use their proper first name and on everything else use their middle name or some you know some other name that is genuinely theirs but they don't like to use their first name. I'm curious now anybody in the audience doesn't use their official first name normally. One, two, six. Happens. Really confuses computer systems. <laughs> So what do you do about this? Right, so the solution in MongoDB 2.4 is, is pretty simple. We have arrays. Great, none of this table nonsense. We have table documents arrays. So all you need to do is put all the main fields in one array and use an array index. I know I'm telling you simple stuff here, but it's really powerful when you actually use it. So first name Juan, first name Garcia, but I'll also have a name field in which I'll put Juan Garcia. And hopefully I'll spell it right in the uh, second one as well, because I just noticed the typo. <laughs> um, when I come to search, don't search in the fields, don't search in these fields, search in this field. Then when I'm searching for Juan and Garcia, it doesn't matter what order they're in. It doesn't matter if I filled in the wrong box. Again, you can try this out by saying, find Maria, all matching, names in any field. And then you find it regardless of which field it actually appears in. 11 milliseconds, not that miserable. There's an alternate solution to this in MongoDB 2.5, 2.6, and that's to build a full text index on name fields. So full text index basically will take whatever's in the field or fields that you specify, will break it up into the individual words, and will index those like they were in array. It will treat basically a string of text as an array. Um, you don't need any extra field storage that way. You're not having to store an array as well as the original names. The downside is currently you can only have one text index per collection. And the way you do that is you do an ensure index, first name text, last name text. So what I'm saying there is. I'd like a text index built on the two fields, first name and last name. So you can specify which fields you want your text index on. And then when I do find, I can say dollar text, search, find Garcia. 
So basically, I can say search um, on my text index, which I only have one, um, for any document which has the word Juan and the word Garcia. So that's not looking for a phrase, that's just looking for both of those words. Okay, the next one we call the specific problem. So the specific problem is where what you're asking for is too specific. I have this problem at Christmas every year because my wife says I want a handbag and I want it to be this big by this big by this big and I want it to be black and I want it to have little diamonds down here and little diamonds down and you think she's seen it in the shop. No, she's just made this up and I'm supposed to look at every single shop for a very specific handbag. It's the same problem with the query. I've got a whole bunch of attributes I'm searching for. I know the guy's name, I know his date of birth, I know his city of birth, um, I know his social security number, but the records don't actually match that. Sure, I've got a record that's got his name and his social security number. I've got another record that's got his name, his date of birth, his place of birth. I'd like both of those, but because I'm asking for it all together, I don't find any of them. An OR query is going to bring me back too many results, because it's going to take his first name and bring back everybody who's got that first name. His last name and bring back everybody who's got that last name. An AND query is the problem I talked about. It's going to find nothing, because there's no one record that's got all of those things. So what I want to be able to do, I've kind of changed the order around here to show you what this looks like. I'm saying I'm looking for John James Staff. Uh, I want at least two of those to match exactly. And you see I found a John James Spinelli. So basically I can say, here are all the, here are all the things I know, but you don't have to find all of them, just find some of them. And yes, you can have weights on that as well. You know, this one's more important than this. So what's the solution to this one? Well, the first thing you need to do is you would query um, using an OR. So you basically say all of these attributes start with the set of records which have all of these attributes. Or have any of one of these attributes, rather. The complete set that are even close. Then I want to score those results using the aggregation framework. So my OR search isn't actually going, finding them, bringing them back to me. The OR search is just the first stage in an aggregation pipeline. And then whichever ones score the highest, I'm going to take those, that will give me a list of IDs, and I can go and retrieve those records. Now, the next slide is scary. So, quick show of hands who's used the aggregation framework. <coughs> okay, guys, if you don't understand the next slide, just lean on one of these guys and fill them back into The aggregation framework in MongoDB is a fantastic thing. Um, it's relatively new. Uh, it basically uh, comes in and replaces both the idea of using MapReduce in order to solve problems. It brings the, the ability to do something equal to SQL select group by having. So basically, you can apply a number of steps to a set of data to join it together, break it up, pull it apart, score it, reshape it, and eventually come up with a set of results. I'm going to walk you through an example of using this in order to do weighted queries. So the aggregation pipeline, I've defined four stages. A, B, that's, that's, a, that's a Scottish B. <laughs> C, it's very subtle differences, a tiny little dot on there, and D. Um, so A says match. So it says go to my database and find any records that match this. And it says, basically it's exactly the same as a MongoDB query. So it says it's an OR where first name is John, or last name is staff, or middle name one is James. So that actually gets translated into a straight MongoDB query against the database. But it doesn't send all those records back. It, on the server, sends them on to the next bit of the pipeline. So project, it's kind of like the normal project in MongoDB in that I can say just take these fields, but it lets me also apply changes to them. I can add them together. I can multiply them. Um, I can choose to include them or not include them. And I can also do conditional things. So going, you know, you can see this is nested. Going in here, this basically says if the first name is equal to John, then let the value of this be equal to 1, otherwise 0. 
So basically, that becomes a 1 or a 0, depending on whether for this record, so this has picked all the records, then for each record, let this be equal to 1 or 0, depending on whether or not the first name is John. This is equal to 1 or 0, depending on whether the middle name is James. And same for staff. This adds these three together. So what I end up with at the end of this is a whole bunch of documents. So it reads these documents and it spits out a bunch of documents which actually only have the ID, because the ID is carried through automatically, and a single value, C, which is equal to the sum of these three. So basically C is a score. C says, okay, was the first name John, the middle name James, the last name Staff. If one of those things is true, score is one, two of them, two, all three of them true, score is three. Is it, is it zero? Anybody know when it's zero? Then, why not? Because there is because a four right. case, so either yes. way it needs to fetch something. Yeah, you're both right. So because we've done the match um, here, we've not looked at any of the documents that we're going to score zero. So we then, coming up here is a whole set of documents, and these are documents that have two values, C and ID. So we do a match again. We basically do a query on that, where C is greater than or equal to 2. Having done that, we do a project, and in this case, just saying ID 1 says basically just keep the ID field. So what drops out here is a list of IDs. Well, we can take that list of IDs, so the way you run an aggregation is like this, aggregate and a list of your stages, A, B, C, D. And then we, that will give us a list of IDs, and we can drop that into a find by saying, look at the original data where the ID is in this set. So this query, <coughs> relatively complex, says go off and find anything where at least two of these things match. Uh, I know it's stored by this field, like here we have where C is greater or equal as 2. For example, I want to see records that have scale, scale 2, on that, on that C records with 1. Yeah. Do you question? Uh, so you'd want to pull out all the ones which are 2 and then all the ones which are 1. Yeah. Just to buy the just do a sort. Yeah. So instead of doing a match here, I would do a sort on this, and that will give me a set of them ordered by the twos first, then the ones. There are, there are a few things you can do in, uh, again, in MongoDB 2.5, 2.6, which let you, at any stage in this pipeline, drop it out to a collection. And then you can use that collection like a temporary table, effectively, to, to then do kind of additional aggregations without having to do the first stage again. So did that, did that make sense to everyone, or do you want me to walk through it again? Because the next one's slightly harder. As you've all got that one, it's probably not going to be that hard. So the next one, you know the example we had where we had one array with the names in? So now I want to do find anything where at least two of these match in any field. So I've got two names, and any one of those names could appear in, in any of these fields. But what I don't want to do is find the same name twice as well. So if the guy's called, um, it's not there. There are, actually there are cultures that do this. So the guy's called you know, Muhammad, Muhammad, Al-Muhammad. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, uh, and one question. Can you maybe uh, point fine because I don't believe the, in the point four, there is a method to specify custom operators in the navigation framework. Uh, so, for example, we can use something like uh, we can create our own operator, like leverage name this time, and do it. Uh, not, nothing to create custom operators. No, in any of them. No. Okay. Uh, but you can use MapReduce, yes. Yeah. You can use MapReduce, but yeah. we, we advise against MapReduce unless you really have to because it's a couple of hundred times slower than your aggregation framework. So, the aggregation framework tends to cover sort of 95 plus percent of cases. Um, that people have, and then after that you can, you can use MapReduce. What the um, uh, previous example with the regex was is actually a length sign distance of one. Yeah. You probably spotted that. Um, so scoring an array 
is kind of similar. So I've got a list of names. I want to find out from this set what the, the intersection looks like. Um, that does actually make me wonder about something as well. Um, so again, query first using an OR. We unwind the names array. So in the aggregation framework, if a document comes in that has an array in it, we can actually convert that into multiple documents, each of which has all the same fields, but each value from the array. So an array of three different values becomes three documents. Each one has a unique value from that array. We then run through that, grouping them back together, and adding the matches into a set. So I end up with a set of unique and distinct matches, and then I count the length of that set. How many of these things, how many different names match? And in order to count the set length in 2.4, you actually unwind it again and regroup summing it together. In 2.6, there's a dollar size operator that will do that for you. So, same star, but we have an all names array this time. So we're looking for that <coughs> all any of those in the all names array. So we unwind the all names array, so we end up with one document with each name and duplicates of the ID. We then do the same projection, looking at the uh, uh, unwound version. And this time, rather than summing them, what we're doing is we're concatenating them together because we're turning it into either the name or a blank. And we then group these back together. So what C ends up with is a list of names but only names which were John, Staff, and James. It basically throws away any names which were duplicates and any names which weren't in that set. So we end up where each document has a list of only the names which were in this set and all the other names thrown away. We can then unwind that list of unique matching names, group them back together again as a count, and do the match. And there's a little <coughs> subtlety here, which you'll see in the code, um, where because of this blank that everyone has, this null, um, we have to do greater than or equal to three. So every single record is going to have at least two. It's going to have the name that matched and the blank as being unique valued. If somebody can find a better way of doing that, please tweet or email me. Um, and then we just predict the other <coughs> the same as the previous one. So what does that look like? I'm looking for John James Staff. I want at least two in any field exact, and I'll find Murray, James, John, and Assetti, John, James, Spinello, Orville, John, Ricky, Staff. So basically, I've given it a bunch of names, and I can find any subset of two of those. And again, very, very quick to come back. So in summary, um, I didn't change that title. Um, you can find mistakes in your data in any field. There will be mistakes, but if you're clever about your queries, you will still find the records, even though there are errors in the data or errors in the query, because when people are querying, you have the same problem that the data is fine, but they didn't hear the name right when you were searching. You can wait and score results. So those two techniques that I've just shown you, you can take those to actually apply scoring. You know, okay, matching on... The real name is worth more than matching on the sound alike. Um, and finding it in the field I expect it to be in is worth a bit more than finding it in a field I didn't expect it to be in. So you can actually calculate a score for how well you matched everything. Um, it does mean that sometimes you need more indexes, more fields or more indexes, but actually not as many as you'd think. Because if you've got a sound alike index, you can normally throw away the exact match index and then just do search on the sound alike, and then refine by an unindex refine of the um, exact name. So it doesn't usually cost you any extra indexes. Equally, sometimes you have to have some additional small collections, such as the, uh, the name vocabulary. But that collection is going to be one or two gigabytes. In the grand scheme of things, it's not much. Um, thank you very much. My name is John Page. I work for uh, MongoDB. If you want the code for this, um, it's on GitHub, my uh, John L. Page Fuzzgo. Uh, if you, uh, also, if you Google for Fuzzgo, 
Um, you should find there's a blog post and a white paper that describes all these techniques in a little more detail. Um, and if you want to now be abusive about me, uh, Twitter and join our page. If you want to say nice things about me, then uh, I think this is the hashtag. <laughs> and thank you very much.